Let's talk about biconditional statements and counterexamples. Biconditional statements are what you write if the converse of your conditional statement is true, and a counterexample is what you provide if the converse is false. So first let's just review. A conditional statement has two parts, the hypothesis and the conclusion. The hypothesis is whatever follows the word if, and the conclusion is whatever follows the word then. And to create a converse of a conditional statement, you just flip around the hypothesis and the conclusion. And as we alluded to in the previous lesson, converses will not necessarily be true. That is the main focus of this lesson. What do you do if it's true? And what do you do if it's false? If the converse is true, then you write a biconditional statement. A biconditional statement is written with the hypothesis and the conclusion connected by the words if and only if. That phrase, if and only if, can be abbreviated as IFF. Let's take a look at an example. Our conditional statement is, if an angle is right, then it measures 90 degrees. Yep, that's true. And the converse, if I just switch around the original hypothesis and conclusion, my converse would say, if an angle measures 90 degrees, then it's right. And that's also true. So since the converse of my true conditional statement is true, that means I need to write a biconditional statement. And biconditional statements take this form. Hypothesis, if and only if, conclusion. And when I'm referring to hypothesis and conclusion, that's the hypothesis and conclusion of the original conditional statement, not the converse's hypothesis and conclusion. Because remember, the converse is the reverse of the conditional statement. So its hypothesis is the conclusion, and the conclusion is the hypothesis. Long story short, make sure you're using the hypothesis and conclusion of the conditional statement, not the converse. So let's fill in the blanks. The hypothesis is an angle is right, and the conclusion is it measures 90 degrees. So putting that all together, I have an angle is right if and only if it measures 90 degrees. So you'll notice that our formatting is a little different than what we're used to seeing with conditional statements and converses. I don't start with the word if, and I don't have the word then anywhere in my biconditional statement. Instead, I start with the hypothesis. Remember, the hypothesis is what comes after the word if. And I end with the conclusion. The conclusion are the words that come after the word then. And the words if and only if come in between. And if you prefer, you can abbreviate if and only if as IFF. So you can say an angle is right if and only if it measures 90 degrees. And that's how you write a biconditional statement. And a biconditional statement is what you write if the converse is true. But what if it's false? That's what a counterexample is for. Unlike biconditional statements, counterexamples don't have a specific form that they have to be written in. Basically, a counterexample is just prove me wrong. Show me an example of how whatever I just said isn't true. And that could be words, it could be diagrams. As long as you're describing a situation in which that converse is false, then you've provided a counterexample. Let's take a look. You might remember this conditional statement and its converse from part one of this lesson. The conditional statement is, if you live in St. Louis, then you live in Missouri. And to make the converse, you switch that around and say, if you live in Missouri, then you live in St. Louis. Well, that's not necessarily true. Just because you live in Missouri doesn't mean that you live in St. Louis. So you could say something like a person could live in Kansas City and still live in Missouri. So you're proving that converse false. In fact, you don't even have to write a full sentence like this. If you had just said the words Kansas City or Springfield or Branson or O'Fallon, any other city in Missouri other than St. Louis, that would be a proper counterexample. So let's take a look at a few examples and determine should I write a biconditional statement or should I provide a counterexample? Our conditional statement is if a number is divisible by 10, then it is divisible by 5. Well, that's true, right? Like 20, for example. 20 is divisible by 10, and therefore it's also divisible by 5, right? 20 divided by 10 is 2, and 20 divided by 5 is 4. So the conditional statement is true. But let's talk about the converts. If a number is divisible by 5, then it is divisible by 10. Now, there are examples, and then there could also be counterexamples for this. 
you could pick a number that works for this converse. If a number is divisible by 5, well, let's just use 20 again. 20 again is divisible by 5. 20 divided by 5 is 4. And then it's also divisible by 10. 20 divided by 10 is 2. But that's an example. Could you come up with a counterexample? Could you come up with something that works for this hypothesis of being divisible by 5, but doesn't work for this conclusion of being divisible by 10? Well, what about 15? 15 is divisible by 5, right? 15 divided by 5 is 3. But can I divide 15 by 10? Not evenly, right? It wouldn't get a, an integer answer. So this is false. This converse is not true. And 15 would be my counterexample. Or 45, or 75, or 5, or any number that's divisible by 5, but not divisible by 10. Again, you don't even have to write it as a full sentence like I did. If you just said 15, that's enough, because that is an example that shows that this converse is not always true. Let's look at another one. If a person uses their phone during class, then they will have their phone taken away. Yeah, that's true, at least in Mrs. Goforth's class. If a person is using their cell phone while I'm teaching, I'm going to have to take it away. But let's flip it around. If a person has their phone taken away, then they were using it during class. Well, is that the only reason that you could have your phone taken away? Because you were using it during my class? Could you think of any other reason why someone's phone would get taken away? Yeah, I can think of a few. So I would say that that converse is false. For example, maybe your mom doesn't like you using your cell phone at the dinner table, and she took it away because you were using it at dinner. Or maybe you got arrested and went to jail. They took away all of your belongings when they put you in that jail cell, so they took your cell phone away, but it wasn't because you were using it during class. Either of those, or anything else you can come up with, would all be examples of a counterexample. It's anything that proves that that converse is not always true. Let's try another one. If points are collinear, then they lie on the same line. That's our conditional statement, and it's true. And the converse says that if points lie on the same line, then they are collinear. Can you come up with a counterexample for that? If points lie on the same line, are they ever not collinear? Well, no, that's the definition of collinear, right? This is true. There's no way to prove that false. If points are on the same line, then they're collinear. That's just what it's called. So for this, we make a biconditional statement, which is to say that we write the hypothesis and the conclusion of the original statement connected by the words if and only if. So my answer here would be, points are collinear, if and only if, they lie on the same line. Feel free to abbreviate if and only if as IFF. Let's try another one. If the measure of angle ABC is 35 degrees, then it is an acute angle. Yep, that's true. 35 is less than 90, therefore it's acute. But let's flip it around. Our converse is, if angle ABC is acute, then it measures 35 degrees. Could you come up with a counterexample for that? Could you prove it wrong? Could you come up with a situation where that is not necessarily true? Those are basically the questions you need to be asking yourself when you decide if you need a counterexample or a biconditional statement. And there are plenty of counterexamples that you could provide for this. Remember that acute just means less than 90. So any number that's less than 90 but not 35 would prove that this could be false. So you could say that it's 45 degrees, or 2 degrees, or 89 degrees. Anything that's between 0 and 90 and not 35 would be a counterexample for this converse. Our next example says if angles are complementary, then they add up to 90 degrees. And its converse is if angles add up to 90 degrees, then they are complementary. Could you come up with a counterexample for that? If angles add up to 90 degrees, are they ever not complementary? Well, no, that's the definition of complementary, right? If angles are complementary, then they add up to 90 degrees. And if angles add up to 90 degrees, then they're complementary. Both of these statements are true. There's no way to provide a counterexample. So for this, I need to write a biconditional statement. I'll take the original hypothesis, angles are complementary, then put if and only if, and then the conclusion, they add up to 90 degrees. Angles are complementary if and only if they add up to 90 degrees. For our last few examples, we're putting everything all together, both from this lesson and from the previous video. 
I'm going to show you a normal everyday sentence, and you need to convert it into a if-then conditional statement, and you need to write its converse. And finally, you need to decide if you should write a biconditional statement or a counterexample based on whether the converse is true or false. And for this example, let's pretend like we're limiting it to the United States of America, because I know we can make the argument that a July in Australia is not summertime. So let's just pretend like we're only talking about the United States. July is in the summer. We need to convert that into a if-then conditional statement. But this is one of those kind of challenging sentences to convert, because it only has one verb. It has is. So remember, in this situation where you only have one verb, anything to the left of that verb is the hypothesis, and anything to the right is the conclusion. So you would kind of say something like, if July, then summer. But we need to make that actually sound correct in English. So I would say something like, if it is July, then it is summer. Then let's switch that around for our converse. If it is summer, then it is July. Okay, well, is that true? Just because it's summertime, does that guarantee that it's July, at least in the United States of America? Not necessarily. It could be August, or it could be June, and it would still be summertime. So for this example, I would need to provide a counterexample to show how that converse could be false. Let's try another one. Vertical angles are congruent. Here's another one that only has the one verb. So I'm going to cut it off right there. To the left of the verb is the hypothesis. To the right of the verb is the conclusion. So in essence, what I'm saying is if vertical angles, then congruent. But I need to kind of spruce that up a little bit to make it sound good in English. So I would say something like if angles are vertical angles, then they are congruent. And switching that around for my converse, I would say that if angles are congruent, then they are vertical angles. Well, could you come up with a counterexample for that? Is that always true? If angles are congruent, do they have to be vertical? This is a good example of one that you might draw a diagram for your counterexample, because this converse is not always true. For example, this diagram. These two angles are both labeled as 30 degrees which means they're congruent. But they're definitely not vertical angles because they're not non-adjacent angles formed by the intersection of two lines. So this would be a counterexample to prove that converse false. It's just that this time I provided a diagram as my description for the counterexample instead of words. And here's another example where we only have one verb. So we're gonna have to cut it off at the word intersect intersect is the verb, anything to the left of it is the hypothesis, anything to the right of it is my conclusion. So in essence what we're saying is if perpendicular lines, then right angles. But let's make that sound appropriate in English, something like if lines are perpendicular, then they intersect to form right angles. A common mistake I see on this one is that students will say if perpendicular lines intersect, then they form right angles. But that doesn't make any sense. Perpendicular lines always intersect. So to have a hypothesis of if perpendicular lines intersect, well, that's not really telling you anything. Perpendicular lines have to intersect. That's part of their definition. So make sure that when you're writing this, it actually makes sense, not just based on how we form conditional statements, but also on what it actually is that you're saying. The proper way to write this if-then statement would be if lines are perpendicular, because lines may or may not be perpendicular, right? So this is a hypothesis that actually tells you something interesting. If lines happen to be perpendicular, then they intersect to form right angles. So let's flip it around for our converse. If lines intersect to form right angles, then they are perpendicular. Okay, can you make a counterexample? Is there ever a situation where that would be false? And for this one, the answer is no. The converse is true, so we need to write a biconditional statement. For this, I would say lines are perpendicular if and only if they intersect to form right angles. 
I would like you to go ahead and pause the video and try this last example on your own. Okay, let's take a look. A midpoint divides a segment into two congruent segments. Well, there's only one verb again this time, divides. So to the left of that verb is the hypothesis, and to the right, all of the rest of this is the conclusion. So if midpoint then divides a segment into two congruent segments. But that doesn't sound great for the first part, right? I can't just say if midpoint. So I would say something more like if a point is a midpoint then it divides a segment into two congruent segments. Okay, let's flip that around. If a point divides a segment into two congruent segments, then it is the midpoint. Could you prove that wrong? Is there a counterexample for that? The answer is no. If it's a point that's dividing a segment in half, then it has to be the midpoint. So my biconditional statement would say, a point is a midpoint if and only if it divides a segment into two congruent segments. And that's all you need to know about conditional statements and their converses, as well as biconditional statements and counterexamples. In our next lesson, we're going to talk about logical reasoning with the law of syllogism and the law of detachment.